pick up, uh, there was a verse within our text that we covered this morning in Sunday school. And so we want to read in Acts chapter 13, uh, and we want to read verses 6 through 12 this morning, and then we want to uh, take our text, our thought from verse 10. And when they had gone through the isle unto Paphos, they found a certain sorcerer, a false prophet, a Jew whose name was Bar-Jesus, which was with the deputy of the country, Sergius Paulus, a prudent man who called for Barnabas and Saul and desired to hear the word of God. But Elamus the sorcerer, for so is his name by interpretation, withstood them, seeking to turn away the deputy from the faith. Then Saul, who also is called Paul, filled with the Holy Ghost, set his eyes on him, and said, O full of all subtlety and all mischief, thou child of the devil, thou enemy of all righteousness, wilt thou not cease to pervert the right ways of the Lord? And now, behold, the hand of the Lord is upon thee, and thou shalt be blind, not seeing the sun for a season. And immediately there fell on him a mist and a darkness, and he went about seeking some to lead him by the hand. And the deputy, when he saw what was done, believed, being astonished at the doctrine of the Lord. Verse 10, O full of all subtlety, and all mischief, thou child of the devil, thou enemy of all righteousness, wilt thou not cease to pervert the right ways of the Lord? Now, there's a few things here we want to notice and, and consider this morning. One of the things that we, as he mentions here, he says, the subtlety and mischief. You know, in, in Genesis chapter, chapter 3, it starts, starts out and speaks of Satan, the devil, as being more subtle, or the serpent being more subtle than all the beasts of the field. That is a character trait of Satan, is the subtlety. And he says, Thou child of the devil, John, the Gospel of John chapter 8, verse 24 Jesus said, Ye are of your father the devil. Uh, eight, no, that's. Uh, did it again. 44. That's what it was. I put 24. It's 44. John 8, 44. Ye are of your father the devil, and the lusts of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. And so he says, Thou child of the devil, so you are of your father the devil, and the lusts of your father ye will do. Thou enemy, of all righteousness. Uh, 1 Peter 5, 8. It says, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. He's the enemy of all righteousness. He's an enemy of the righteous, of God's people. He's our adversary. Uh, 2 Thessalonians 2 7. Second Thessalonians 2 For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. So he is already at work. The mystery of iniquity or the secret purpose of lawlessness. He's the enemy of all righteousness. 
He said, Wilt thou not cease to pervert the right ways of the Lord? One of the things when we read in John talking about he abode not in the truth. And that phrase you will see as we look through here is kind of significant. I, I didn't really notice that until I was studying this. He did not remain in the truth. He did not abide in the truth or continue in the truth. He said, Wilt thou not cease to pervert the right ways of the Lord? And I want us to notice something about that phrase and, and what that indicates. He is a perverter of the right ways. He is a perverter of truth. Now, in that sense, he is not the inventor, if you will, of error or sin. That is, sin or error doesn't stand alone by itself. Before you can have sin, before you can have error, you have to have the truth. That is the starting point. Satan did not continue in the truth. Truth was the starting point. God created all things. God is truth. And all His ways are true. And all His ways are righteous. That is the starting point. But Satan would not continue in those things. And so... God shows us the right way, the correct path. But Satan takes that truth and twists it. Remember, he is subtle. Genesis, as we mentioned, Genesis uh, chapter 3 and verse 1. And, and notice... Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2, verse 16. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat. Semicolon. Not pure. But, of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Okay. That is a true statement. That is the truth. Now, notice what Satan does in chapter 3. Verse 1 says, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, He shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Question mark. End of, end of quote. Well, that's what God said, wasn't it? Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat. See, he's subtle. And this is the point. In every lie that Satan tells, in every perversion, it is a perversion of truth. It has an element of truth in it. That's why Eve was so easily deceived. That's why people are deceived. There is always enough truth in what he says that people recognize. And you have to go back and understand when God spoke that, he spoke that to Adam before Eve was created. Eve learned the truth from Adam. And so when Satan comes to Eve and he quotes God exactly, 
up to a point. And then he stops. He doesn't finish what God says. And based on that, because see, that's what perverting something, it, it's twisting it. And so in Galatians chapter 1, Paul writing to the Galatians in verse 6 says, I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another. There's not more than one gospel. There's only one gospel. There's only one truth. But there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel. They twist it. And that's the way Satan operates. He takes truth and then he twists it. That's what the idea of perverting, it, you twist it to where it's no longer what it was. So which is not another gospel, but there are some who would pervert the gospel. And he goes on and says, but though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. You know, he goes on when he's writing to the church at Corinth. He said, how I say something among you, there's no resurrection of the dead. You know, you can preach that God, Jesus Christ died for our sins according to the Scripture and He was buried. But if you stop there, That's true. But if you stop there, it's no longer the truth. He rose again. Jesus said, according to my gospel, Christ rose from the dead. And so, we see how Satan tends to operate. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11, He says in verse 4. Well, let's, let's back up verse 3 because this goes back to what we were saying in Genesis. But I fear, lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if ye receive another spirit, which ye have not received, or another gospel, which ye have not accepted, you might well bear with him. And so here Paul, he lays out three in Galatians, he, he says another gospel. Here he says another Jesus, another spirit, another gospel. Um, which he says is not another there be some that would trouble you. Now, in chapter 11, he goes on and he identifies the, the some. But there be some that would trouble you from Galatians chapter 1 we read. But in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 13, for such are false apostles deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. He said, if anybody comes, I preach it, let them be accursed. Anathema. That is, they are under condemnation to hell. Very serious. Very strong words. 
That's why he said, whose end shall be according to their work. If they are perverting the gospel, if they pervert the truth of the person of Jesus Christ, if they pervert the truth concerning the Holy Spirit, they pervert the truth of the gospel. They're anathema. Um, but as we said, which is not another. I mean, there's only one Jesus Christ who is our Lord and Savior. There's only one. They teach something different. They preach another Jesus, which is not another. They perverted the truth. Error does not exist apart from the truth. As I said, error is not a separate category per se. It doesn't stand alone. Error Truth exists first. Error is that which does not abide or continue in the truth. Error is a perverting of the truth, a twisting of the truth. Uh, and, and therefore, you know, as we, we think of the definitions of sin, sin and error is missing the mark. It's falling short. It's turning aside from the truth. And so as we think of those things, and, and as we have mentioned, all of Satan's lies contain a certain element of truth because that's where it began. It begins with truth. And then it perverts it. Jeremiah 6.16 So we, we quote this a lot. Seems like there's a lot of opportunities to uh, quote this. This is one of those verses that sticks out for me. He said, Thus saith the Lord, Stand ye in the ways, and see, and ask for the old paths, where is the good way, and walk therein. And you shall find rest for your souls. See, that's, that's the right paths. That's the right ways of God. Those things that He has established from the beginning. Forever, O Lord, Thy word is settled in heaven. God does not change. He doesn't change His mind. Now, He has made certain changes in administrations from time to time. But as far as the truths of God, creation, righteousness, those things don't change. And that's why he's, he's saying here to the people, said, you know, you stand in the ways. There's a lot of different ways out there. Jesus, when he was preaching the Sermon on the Mount, he said, you know, there's a straight and narrow way, and few there be that find it. For broad is the way, gate, wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And many there be which go in there out. There are a lot of ways. He says, stand in them. That is, stand there and, and observe what they are. He said, but then he said, ask for the old paths. Out of all of these different ways, what are the old paths? Where is the good way? That which is right, that which is according to truth, that which God has established from the beginning. He said, walk in those. But the answer was, but they said, we will not walk therein. They would not abide or continue in those. Which kind of corresponds to 2 Timothy. Paul was admonishing Timothy there. He said, preach the word. So all scripture is given by the inspiration of God. And it's profitable. So preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season. Uh, 2 Timothy chapter 4. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long-suffering doctrine. 
For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. I mean, they won't stay in it. But after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. Those who pervert the truth. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth. And shall be turned into fables. Fables. Those are false things. But remember what he said. Satan is so. He knows. We know enough truth. That if it's an out and out lie. We'll recognize it. That's the reason he started with a half truth. And built upon that half truth, the lie, thou shalt not die. But see, that's what the other part of, the, of God's statement said, thou shalt die. So he added a lie to a half truth. And deceived. But he began with the half truth, get our attention. And that's the way he operates. Uh, but understand this. A half truth is not the truth. A twisted truth is not the truth. Just because it has some truth in it doesn't make it the truth. What is the statement, you know, in court, you're supposed to lay your hand on the Bible, swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Well, whether or not you believe in swearing an oath on the Bible or anything, the Bible says, let your yea be yea and your nay nay. Uh, but the idea, the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth. Because once you don't tell the whole truth, it's no longer the truth. Once you add something to the truth that's not true, it's no longer the truth. And so, we see that's how Satan, he perverted the right way, the sound doctrine. Um, and some of the ways we see this, because as you mentioned, if they preach another Jesus, another spirit, or another gospel. And, and these are the things that Satan primarily will attack. Because this is the foundation of Christianity. Denying the deity of Christ, denying the death, burial, and and the resurrection of Christ is perverting the truth of Christ and the gospel. We mentioned before there was a book that was very popular. They made a movie based on the book, but the whole premise of it was that Jesus didn't really die. He survived the crucifixion. He was hidden. And he grew up, got married, had children, and eventually died of old age. That's a perversion. Denying the deity of Christ. That is making of him merely a man. And that is a pervert, that's another Jesus. Don't be fooled by those things. However much truth might be woven into that story, that is a perversion of the truth. We, we talk about perversion in other areas. I'm a perversion of truth is a worse perversion. Or at least it's just as bad as the other kind of perversions that we see being espoused today. That's a perversion too. 
It's a perversion of the right way. It's a perversion of how God created man and woman and, and perversion of marriage and so on. Element of truth, that's the reason people buy into it and talk about love and all these different things, companionship and all this. But that's not marriage. That's not why God created the woman to be the helpmeet for the man, the complete man. Anyway, that's also a perversion. But teaching salvation by works, you know, the fact that we can be saved, that God offers salvation, that's the truth, but He doesn't offer it to us by our works. He doesn't say, well, if you can do this and do that and do that, then I'll save you. I'll forgive you of your sins. No. Salvation is by grace through faith. And that not of yourselves is the gift of God. Not of works, lest any man should boast. Where is boasting? It's excluded. There's no room for it. There's nothing that I, you or I can boast in that we did in order to secure our salvation. It is totally of grace. By the power of God. No boasting. Teaching that you can be saved and lose your salvation, eternal life, is a perversion of the gospel. John 3, 16, which is so often quote, I give unto you eternal life. They shall never perish. What does that mean? Eternal life and they shall never perish. John 5, 24. Verily, verily, truly, truly, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. There is therefore now, now, no condemnation. You know, it's the idea, well, you know, you go along, you live your life, you do the best you can, you, you, and hope that when you die, your good works will outweigh your bad. He says, there is therefore now, not after you die, now no condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus. Why? Because when we believe on Him, we have in the present, now, the forgiveness of sin. We have now eternal life. And eternal life is just that. It lasts forever. There's no end to it. And we have it now. And we'll never come into condemnation or judgment for our sins because we have been passed from death, from that condemnation, unto life. Our judgment for sin has already taken place. It took place on the cross when Jesus died for my sins. That was my death. That was my judgment and condemnation for sin. And when I put my faith in Him, I have as a present possession eternal life because He died my sin debt for me. He died that death. And so when I believe, I have passed from death unto life. He says, I'll never come into condemnation. That's His promise. So when... People teach, well, you know, you, you need to do this and you need to do that to be saved. And, and you can be saved, each other, but if you sin, you do certain sins that are bad enough, you can lose your salvation. That's a perversion of the truth. He's, oh, you Baptists believe that once saved, always saved. You can go out and live however you want and you'll still go to heaven. That's a perversion of the truth because that's not what we believe. See, they're making an assessment based on their belief system. They're comparing apples with oranges, not apples with apples, if you will. Again, Satan is so, his lies have a certain element of truth. We ought not to sin. 
We ought not to do those things. But God deals with us as His children. And we are eternally His children. And if we sin, we have an advocate with the Father. The lost do not have an advocate with the Father. They're under condemnation. But we're saved and we become the children of God. And we have an advocate with the Father who is Jesus Christ. And when we confess our sins, He's faithful and He's just to forgive us of our sins. Why? Because it's already under the blood. He can justly forgive us our sins. So what well, if you don't confess it? Then He'll chastise you until you do. And then you'll confess and you're faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So well, what if... You know, I can sin and sin, he never chastised. Then he says, You're bastards and not sons. See, now in these, all these subtle ways, he has perverted the truth of the gospel. That's what he does. Uh, you know, that's, that's what Paul, in, in, in speaking of the sorcerer here, Elamus, Oh, full of all subtlety and all mischief. See, he's identifying him with his father, the devil. You are of your father, the devil, and the lust of your father, you will do. So you're acting just like your father. Full of subtlety and mischief. What about mischief? Go back and read the book of Proverbs. Ecclesiastes. He talks about mischief there. Thou child of the devil. Thou enemy of all righteousness. Satan is the enemy of the truth. He is the enemy of all righteousness. He is our enemy. You're saved, a child of God, and walking in the truth. Well, what John, over in his letters, he speaks of that. 2 John, the elder and the elect lady and her children, whom I love in the truth. Not I only, but also all they that have known the truth, and for the truth's sake which dwelleth in us, and shall be with us forever. I rejoice greatly that I found of thy children walking in truth, as we have received the commandment. You see, when God says, stand in the ways, and ask for the old path, walk there. They are. That's what they're doing. They're walking in the truth. And for that reason, Satan is our adversary. He is our enemy. And he seeks whom he can destroy. He can devour through deception. We can be deceived. And so, again, it, it behooves us as His people to be thoroughly grounded in the truth. I believe in Ephesians. Um, Ephesians chapter 4 verse 12 said, for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, there's that subtlety, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. And so it becomes us to be rooted and grounded and to grow in, in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and in faith that we be not so easily deceived, that we be not blown to and fro by every wind of doctrine. 
but rooted and grounded in the truth. Because once you know the truth, you don't need to keep searching for something else. You know, it's like, like people have been taught the truth, but it's like, well, I want to see what this one teaches. I want to see what that one's talking about. Why? If you already have the truth, any truth they might have in their teaching, you already have it. And anything else they have is a... And it's probably what truth they do have is perverted because they've added... It's not the whole truth and they've added something to it. And so it's a perversion of the truth. So why, why would you want to seek that out? You know, we need to know the truth. We need to be rooted and grounded in the truth. And once you have not just been told, well, this is the truth. I mean, don't believe something and take just because I tell you I'm your pastor. And, and don't assume that because I'm the pastor, well, I know what I'm talking about. Have a, a nobility of character like the Bereans. You take what I say, take the scripture, take the Bible, go home. Don't just come and sit on Sunday morning, Sunday night, whatever, hear what I teach, kind of absorb a little bit of it, and then forget about it for the rest of the week. Take what I'm saying, take the scriptures, go home and study it. Make sure that what I am saying is according to the Word of God. Thus saith the Lord. And once you've verified that and confirmed and, and reaffirmed in your own mind, develop a conviction about it that this is the truth, this is the Word of God, and don't be moved. That's what Satan wants to do. He wants to move us away from the truth. He doesn't want us to abide in the truth. He is a perverter of the truth. You know, it would seem that everything that Jesus has taught, Satan has offered man a twisted or perverted version of it. When Jesus established His church and he commissioned us and said, Teach them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded. And for every one of those whatsoevers that Jesus has commanded, Satan has taken it and perverted it and twisted it into something else and is feeding it back to people to deceive. And and one of the ways he does it, he, he'll twist it a little bit and, and get you to accept that as kind of the hook. You know, that bit of perverted truth, that half-truth with something else attached to it. But then little by little, he leads you further and further away from the truth. There's less and less truth and more and more perversion, more and more lie that he has added to it until eventually there's hardly any truth at all left. And that's the way He works. And we need to be aware of that. Uh, we need to be aware of the snares of our adversary, the devil, and how He works. Um, as we said, Satan's subtle perversions of the truth is not limited just to the doctrine of Christ and the Gospel. But to all things that He's commanded, all the counsel of God is subject to His twisting as well. And Jesus said in Matthew 16, 18, Upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Satan has twisted to truth and made that rock Peter instead of Christ. And say, so, yeah. See, in Matthew He said, Upon this rock I will build my church. Well, that's the truth. But then they take the rock and they apply that to Peter. And that's the false. And so, much of Christianity today, they're, they're very, and that's one of the things that we'll be showing here in, in, when we get to teaching on that and using that chart, is 
that version of the, the concept of the church that most of the world has accepted is based upon that perversion of the truth that he founded his church upon Peter. That's the perverted version that has been, Satan has given to man through the Catholic Church. But notice Deuteronomy 32 31. Seems to be appropriate to that. Deuteronomy 32, verse 31. For their rock is not as our rock. Their rock might be Peter. Uh, not really, but that's what they teach. Our rock is the Lord Jesus Christ. For their rock is not as our rock, even our enemies themselves being judges. The church's foundation is sure and everlasting. Many today see the church as the Catholic Church, which they say is founded upon Peter, such as not the church that Jesus built. Many today believe the church, that is the local visible, ceased and was only preserved in the spiritual universal church, such as not the church that Jesus built. Some believe the church had to be reformed, reorganized, reestablished. That's not the church of the New Testament. The church of the New Testament, which is the church Jesus built as a local congregation of scripturally baptized believers. Uh, Ephesians 2.21 something else and here again we see this is how Satan takes the truth, takes the quote but he twists it and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto a holy temple in the Lord. And say, see, that's talking about the, the universal church. But when you study that in, in, in the Greek the phrase all the building is specifying each and every individual building. It's not teaching one universal church, it's speaking of a lot of local churches. It's literally what it's talking about there. Each, every building. You know, grow it to, uh, unto a holy temple in the Lord. In whom, that is, each individual church, ye also are built together. See, ye also. He's talking to the church at Ephesus. And he's pointing them to all the other churches. And he said, each, each of these individual buildings, being fitly framed together, groweth into a holy temple of the Lord, in whom ye also are built together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. So it's talking about local independent congregations, not one universal spiritual congregation. Uh, 1 Corinthians 14.23 talks about when the whole church become together in one place. Usually when it's talking about the church, the whole church, it's talking about, you know, most Protestant-minded people would think of the universal church. But that's not what Paul's talking about because he defines it as the whole church as something that can come together in one place. He's talking to the church of God, which is at Corinth. That's where they come together. There's the church of God at Corinth. They also are built together for a habitation of God through the Spirit. The church which is at Corinth, where the whole church can come together in one place. This can only be done and can only be accomplished by a local visible congregation, each local visible congregation. 
and go on about the doctrine of baptism, immersion water, sprinkling and pouring is a perversion of the truth. He takes a certain truth, a certain element that this is a, a right, this is uh, something that is to be performed, but then he perverts how it is performed. And in doing so, it's no longer the, the picture, the likeness of his death, burial, and resurrection. And so it, it, it loses that attachment that it is supposed to have to the gospel in that it's a picture of the gospel. Uh, when they preach uh, baptism or regeneration or that baptism is essential, you have to be baptized in order to be saved. That's a perversion of the truth. Infant baptism is a perversion of the truth. And, and so on and so forth. We go on and on with all the teachings of God. But notice, if you will, 2 John. verse 8 through 11. He says, Look to yourselves that we lose not those things which we have wrought, but that we receive a full reward. Whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ. Now, what we talked about, how he begins with the truth, but he doesn't abide in the truth, he doesn't stand the truth, but he'll pervert the truth. He'll twist the truth. He'll quote a, a half-truth and then attach a lie to it and so on. Whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ, he hath both the Father and the Son. If there come any unto you and bring not this doctrine, that is the doctrine of Christ, that the, the right ways that He has commanded us. All things whatsoever I've commanded you. Receive Him not into your house, neither bid Him God speed, for He that biddeth Him God speed is a partaker of His evil deeds. We see what Paul said there in Acts the 13th chapter, he identified this man is evil. What he was doing was evil. Paul didn't bid him God speak. Paul cursed him. Not in using foul language, but God cursed him with blindness. We would not be partakers of their evil deeds. So it becomes us to study and to search the Scriptures, as it says, to seek the leadership and inspiration of the Holy Spirit that we might know the truth. Well, how can you really know the truth and be sure it's the truth? All Scripture is given by the inspiration of God. And God cannot lie. All truth. That's where he said it's proper for doctrine, for correction, for proof, for instruction in righteousness. That's what it, that's what it's here for. That's what he gave it to us. Well, how, how can we know that's what it says, or you know, that's what it means? First John five nineteen, and we know. That we are of God, first of all. You're saved. You're a child of God. You know you're of God. And the whole world lieth in wickedness or that wicked one. So you know there's a distinction. There's a difference. We are of God. That Everything else is of the world. There's no in-between. There's no neutral ground. We know that the Son of God has come and hath given us an understanding that we may know Him. That is true. And that we are in Him. That is true. Even His Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. 
So He has come and He's given to us. He's given us an understanding. That's what He said in Matthew, the 13th chapter, when He's talking about the, the parables there. Unto you it is given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. Unto you it is given by the Holy Spirit. These things are spiritually discerned and He gives us the Holy Spirit to seal us, to indwell us as the Comforter, to teach us and to lead us into all truth. What well, said in John 16, 13, that was the purpose of the giving of the Holy Spirit to His church is to lead us, to guide us into all truth. So you can know it. Now He doesn't just open up our head and pour it in. You have to study. You have to search the Scriptures. You need to do so prayerfully as a child of God, asking God, I want to know the truth. Show me the truth. Convince me of the truth. And He will. We have that gift. It's given to us to know. The Holy Spirit is given to us to teach us. <clears throat> 